So thank you very much. This is, we're starting another panel from this uh, very interesting conference about innovation and competition law. I want to thank you again, EBCI, for having this panel and for having me the honor to be the moderator of a panel with two of great figures and two of my intellectual heroes nowadays, Maurice Stuck and Professor Ariel Erzati. And also I want to thank the opportunity to have a talk with a friend and another people that I admire a lot, that's Professor Ana Frazão. Since it's going to be a more dynamic conversation, I'm going to present the two professors in the beginning. So Professor Ariel is the Slaughter MA Professor of Competition Law at the Oxford University, and she's also the head of the Competition Law Center at, uh, law, uh, uh, Center at Oxford University. Professor Maurice is the Douglas A. Blaze Distinguished Professor at the Law College of the University of Tennessee, worked in the DOJ and in the Antitrust, Antitrust Division, and is uh, both of them have uh, several other things in, the, in their resume, but they wrote two seminal books about competition law. One of them that is about uh, digital markets produces the framework that everybody uses to discuss the subject and, until now. And the other one that we're gonna, we're gonna be discussing today is the competition overdose, their, their last book that discuss uh, the, the value in, of competition. And we're also going to have a very uh, brilliant debater, Professor Ana Frazão. Professor Ana Frazão is uh, doctor in business, business law at PUC São Paulo, and she's professor at University of Brasilia. She was a former CAD commissioner, and she is one of the leading professors in express in Brazil. So the word is yours, Professors Ariel and Maurice. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure uh, to join you. Um, Maurice will, will share the slides now. Yep, well, let me get this. All right, and then, um, Super. all right, we're Thank you. ready to go. So um, we want to take this opportunity to share with you some of the themes that we develop in the book, Competition Overdose. And, it is a really exciting book in which we try to identify instances in which the competitive process uh, doesn't deliver as expected. And it's a, it's a nuanced argument. So to begin with, it's important to highlight, of course, that this is not to challenge the general idea that competition delivers immense value to society. We get greater welfare, we get prosperity, we have innovation, we have choice, quality, lower prices, this is all true. But what we have found over the years, and both Maurice and I have been teaching uh, competition law for, for many, many years. And we have found that where we tend to teach our students and tell them, look at all the benefits of competition, the experience they, their peers and their parents have on markets is not always the experience that we used to teach them. We used to tell them that they are the, the kings and queens of the market, that the market always operates to benefit them, that the magical dynamic of competition is there to ensure their welfare. And yet many of them had a feeling that they are in some sort of a rat race. No matter how hard they compete, they just cannot really get the benefit out of competition. And in parallel to that, we started to appreciate that as a society, we elevated the ideal of competition to almost a religion. You have a problem with education, increase competition between universities. You have a problem with your health service, just increase competition. Problem with provision of prisons, create competition. Almost anything that we see that isn't working, we have this inbuilt assumption that either we need to create competition or increase the competitive pressure. And this will eventually deliver the results that we're looking for. But in fact, competition is like medicine. And many times we find that we overload on this medicine. And in the book, what we do is we try to highlight those instances in which we could overdose and maybe provide some warning signs on who's pushing them and how can we cope with that. So Maurice, tell us a bit more about how we structured possibly the, the debate. 
Okay, so <laughs> you often hear about the uh, power of three. Well, we decided to do four, four, and two. So the first part, what we wanted to do is to say, what are the key assumptions underlying competition? When does competition work? And what happens once you start relaxing some of those assumptions? And what we uh, found once we relax those assumptions is at least four areas where the conditions of competition does not assure a positive outcome. In fact, they can produce toxic competition. So rather than coming up with a series of anecdotes, what we've done in the first part is under, look at the underlying assumptions involving competition, what happens then when certain conditions are not present, and then describe how the toxic competition can unfold. Once you do that, you recognize that competition is often beneficial, but it isn't always. And you can then see surprisingly a lot of toxic competition around you. So then we then wondered, well, who's promoting this toxic competition? And we came up with four culprits. We have the ideologues, where we're going to look at the game makers. They're probably the most sinister of the bunch, the lobbyists, as well as the privatizers, the ones who privatize um, industries. And that was going to be our book. It was going to be the 4-4. And our editor said, no. <laughs> That's too depressing. You can't end the book with the game makers, precisely because those are the ones who architect, you know, they're the ones who design a competitive process where we're like the little rats running around chasing after each other. And the one rat might get the nugget of food and everyone else is harmed. You've got to end on a positive note. So the last part, which is probably the most difficult part for us to write, was what do we mean by competition? And if toxic competition is the worst, what would be the best? What would be the idealized form of competition? And that's what we came up with noble competition. And we struggled with that a lot. And we'll go um, into that as well. So we're gonna now talk about some examples of uh, toxic competition. I'll take um, the lead on this one. Um, so, <laughs> What does uh, Craig Cavendish, um, um, what does a hockey player have to do with college admissions as well as an arms race among many different countries? And they all involve one key assumption about competition, that our collective interests are the same as individual interests. That if everyone pursues their individual interests, collectively we're better off. I mean, that's just sort of the Adam Smith invisible hand. And often that's true. And that could be then a race to the top. So one of the things that we point out is that if everyone follows Tom Brady's diet, eats healthy, they're gonna have longer and better athletic careers. There you could see how individual interests lead to a collectively good outcome. The problem though is when the individual interests diverge from the collective interests. And a good example of this are hockey um, players who go helmetless. Now it makes no sense, right? You think about hockey is a high speed game. If you hit the ice with your bare head, that could end your career. No player would want to go without a helmet. So why did so many players go helmetless? And why was it that it required the NHL to impose um, um, a rule in order to get hockey players to wear helmets. And here, once one hockey player recognizes that if they go without a helmet, that gives them a competitive advantage. All the other hockey players will also go helmetless. And then collectively, they're all worse off. None of them have an advantage anymore, but now they're all at greater uh, risk. And you could think about this with testosterone injections for Wall Street traders, um, growth hormones, um, doping scandals and the like. That is the essence, the race to the bottom. So once we then said, well, what would be a good example of this? And we first thought about school rankings and school rankings would be ideal 
from a competition perspective, because here you're able to evaluate schools along different metrics and then have some compilation that parents and students can use to identify what schools should they apply, what schools are better, and that would then incentivize the lower ranked schools to do um, better. That would be then competition on the merits. But what Ariel found out is that in the UK, that can then incentivize cheating, right? Because so much depends on the rankings that you can start gaming the system. But then we realized that that just wasn't the whole story. The real story, when you think about it, an arms race that harms the universities, harms the students, and no one can escape. The great example is US college admissions. Now, <laughs> I've got four children, three of whom have already been through the college admissions process. And so think about this letter. This is from Tulane University. It's a top ranked US News and World Report college. And they send this letter to Genevieve. Now, if you read this letter as a parent, you would probably be ecstatic, right? Who, which parent wouldn't want their kid to get this? Outstanding academics, countless hours of community service, portfolio of extracurricular activities, and they're being invited to apply. No application fee, automatic consideration for partial scholarships, the opportunity to, um, to interview with an alum. I mean, that is great. And any parent of Genevieve would be, really would be proud. So who's Genevieve? Well, to understand the story, Genevieve is the standard schnauzer, our 12-year-old standard schnauzer. So how did a college seek to attract Genevieve to apply to a university? And to take a step back, US News and World Report has multiple factors in how they rank universities. One small aspect was the acceptance rate. So the more students that apply, the more that they can reject, the more prestigious the school looks. So think of that. They don't have to invest in quality of education. All they have to invest is sending out letters like this to schnauzers. They didn't know it was a schnauzer. But um, my wife put just Genevieve in a generic named uh, school, West, and Genevieve got this letter. And Genevieve didn't just get this letter once. She got other letters, including from the University of Chicago and from other universities. And they're all attracted, they all want Genevieve to apply precisely because they can then reject um, the student. And they would then give the appearance of being a better school. And the interesting thing is that this competition is so toxic that Harvard, uh, UVA, and Princeton sought to de-escalate it unilaterally, that they were gonna opt out of this whole early admissions process and they wanted to take a step back and they couldn't. When you have a school like Harvard, they were starting to lose applicants to the other schools that were continuing with this practice they had to jump back in. And so, you know, it, it continues. So what you see here is an arms race that doesn't benefit the schools because now they're spending all of this money to woo candidates in order to reject them. It doesn't benefit the students because now there's this arms race where the parents are like on edge. I've got to get my kid into a top 30 school in order for them to get into a good, uh, you know, to get a good job in order that they're not going to fall on the wrong, ed wrong end of this um, 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 divide between the haves and have nots. It's created this really panic. And so the schools don't benefit, the parents don't benefit, the students certainly don't benefit because it's crushing when you're rejected by multiple schools that would um, you to apply. So that might be one example, right? And you might say, all right, that's esoteric. That's just the neuroses of Americans, right? You know, college admissions might be a problem in America, but what would be then another example of toxic competition? And here is Ariel is going to talk about something that happened in his backyard. Okay. So I want to speak about quality degradation um, and 
we use that as a second example of what happens if you use the simplified idea that more competitive pressure is what you need to resolve all your problems. And as we all know, when you have competitions, you compete on several dimensions. You compete on price, on quality, on service. But for the majority of us, price is the most visible aspect of competition. And most of us rely on price as some sort of an indicator that will assist us in identifying and attributing quality. And we assume that markets work so well that if there is a problem in quality or sometimes in service, the market will help us know about it because customers will discuss it or competitors will actually expose other competitors and inform us that they have quality which is doubtful or they have some issues with their service. So because of those assumptions, we usually think of competition or a market as a boiler. And what you say is, well, if we want to increase welfare, let's increase the pressure in the boiler. And the story, the first story of quality degradation is a story that uh, really affected everyone in Europe and in the UK, and that was the Horsegate scandal. And this was basically the fact that one morning we all woke up to the fact that we are eating horse meat in our burgers, in our lasagna, in our ready meals. And those um, horse, basically, meats uh, found their way into the supply chain. And there were uh, quite a few investigations trying to understand what was it that actually led to the horse meat in our uh, supply chain. But one of the key elements that we want to highlight is, of course, the issue of competitive pressure and how it impacted on quality. And what happened, it's the previous slide, Maurice, and what happened um, in the Horsegate scandal is that you had competition between the supermarkets and the supermarkets basically tried to give us products at a lower price. Those supermarkets then put more pressure on the beef suppliers and the beef suppliers put more pressure on the beef producers. And what happened was that for some producers, at some point, the pressure was so immense that there was no way for them to stay in business. And therefore, the only choice they had was to downgrade the quality. And in that case was to use horse meat. And when you speak, and Maurice and I did, when you speak with people that were in the industry, they directly link it to the competitive pressure. This is not to say the lesson is not that you don't need to have competition, it is that when you increase the pressure in the boiler, you have to be aware of the strength of the boiler. Or in our example, you have to increase also the quality supervision because absent an attempt to do so, what you will find is the competition backfire from competition that serves us. What you have is suddenly competition that becomes toxic. Now, just to highlight that this is not just something that has to do with the food industry. And those examples, by the way, affect beef, affect also um, oil, fish, uh, injecting water. I mean, it's all across uh, the food industry. But let's take another example that, that stem from the same problem that we have with markets. And this, of course, refers uh, to the tragedy of the two 737 MAX that crashed. And once you look at, into that, you realize that one of the problems that led to this was intense competition and lack of supervision. At the time, there was intense competition with the, between Boeing and between Airbus Industries. And at some point, Boeing was able to promise one of its leading clients that it can supply them with a larger airplane that will not require additional training for pilots. And that was the pitch that was given to the engineers. This is a quote from one of the engineers that says, Basically, we were told not to highlight changes that we made that would require additional training. And this is why you had pilots that flew airplanes without being aware of there being a program that is trying to address the problem with the engines. And the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, that is supposed to be responsible for the quality control, well, they actually, because of our trust in the competitive process, because of our idea that we want to have the smallest government ever, 
they gave the supervision function to Boeing. It was Boeing that self-certified that they actually satisfied the quality requirements. So this is another good example of how quality is a very significant parameter that can backfire if you're not aware of it. Which leads us now to another different aspect of toxicity that Maurice will uh, discuss with it and this with us. And this is when competition is actually designed to exploit us rather than benefit us. Yeah. So, I mean, just to build on what Ariel said <clears throat> with the second overdose, it's not just like quality, but we talk about in the book as well, but it's also about human labor. Um, it also is environmental degradation. It's all the different facets that can safety that could lead then to um, 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 horrible uh, results. So when we come then to the third, the assumption is, is that we're pretty good judges of what we want. And our long-term goals that we, we are capable of identifying what our long-term goals are and our short-term actions help further than those long-term goals. So we're homo economicus. We are rational, calculating, um, profit maximizers with perfect willpower. And that basically there's little need for the government to be paternalistic because we can often then choose what best serves our, our needs. And of course, you know, with the behavioral economics literature, over the past 40 years, it's now common, um, it's commonly accepted that we're not exactly like that, that we have bounded uh, willpower, bounded uh, self-interest, and also bounded rationality. So now, what are then the implications then for competition policy? Well, it could be beneficial. Companies can help us overcome our imperfect willpower and help us save more money over longer time periods. And you could see some banks that do that. They can allow automatic deductions from your payroll so you don't even see that money. And you can then be able to, it's like to tie Odysseus to the mask, to the mask that it gives you tools to help you address what you recognize as your bounded willpower. So competition can be beneficial. But you can also see the opposite, where firms then compete to exploit us rather than to benefit us when it is um, more profitable. And when Ariel and I first wrote about you know, behavioral economics, <laughs> some people within the antitrust circles thought we were like, you know, from a different planet. Like, how can you discuss behavioral economics? You know, the markets are perfectly rational, that the markets drive out irrationality and the like. Well, we've moved a long way since then. In the United States complaint against Google, one of the things that's noteworthy, and it's the same thing you saw in the earlier European Commission cases involving a Windows Media Player, is the importance of defaults and how defaults can play a key role. So here, Google didn't prevent DuckDuckGo from being the um, 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 a search engine. And you could easily click to change your search engine to DuckDuckGo, but it's the power of defaults. It's, a, it's how people stick with the um, defaults. Now, if we want to then look at toxic competition, we come then to uh, drip pricing. And to drip pricing, we come then to Las Vegas. So, the key thing about Las Vegas is you know you're being taken, but you don't know exactly how, right? You know you're gonna be exploited some way or the other. So one of the things that Ariel and I notice is that when you book hotels, particularly in Las Vegas, you can start off with a really low price, like Circus Circus, $30 a room. And you think that's wonderful. But then as you go through the booking process, you start noticing these fees or they're, they're just like, they just appear on your total. And when, you've, when you're about ready to check out, you go from a $30 fee to a $60 fee. And we also see this with Trump Hotel in um, Las Vegas. And here, 
the FTC held a series of workshops and drip pricing plays into several heuristics of, 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 of humans. And what was noteworthy here was that Caesars, which is a, you know, has several casinos, actually took an active stand against drip pricing, saying we're not going to engage in this behavior. But it couldn't go against the tide. For whatever reason, most consumers were still drawn by that low price and they were still losing money by paying more ultimately in the end. And it doesn't have to be that way. It's not pro-competitive. It doesn't serve any greater purpose. It actually reduces price transparency. There's really no redeeming quality to it. In fact, one of our friends in Australia, he helped us because one night we said, okay, we want you to book a room at the Trump Hotel. Turns out if you use an Australian booking site, there's no drip pricing. But when he tried to book it directly on Trump, he was also um, targeted with drip pricing, even though that's illegal under um, Australian law. So here, what you could see is that drip pricing continues. It's actually increasing. And what was really interesting here was that lobbyists use the competition ideology to prevent any sort of regulation against drip pricing because they deemed it to be like anti-competitive, which is sort of paradoxical. But now we're going to go to the architects of the game. And this is probably the most sinister of the lot. And Ariel is going to help us understand who they are and why they're so bad. So, so far, we gave you three categories of toxicity. Uh, in the book, we cover more, but to give you an idea of when the process of competition just doesn't believe, deliver. And now we're trying to think of who is pushing this type of toxicity or who is capable of benefiting from toxic competition. And one of the interesting aspects, and this in some way is a continuation of our work on virtual competition, was for us to look at the online environment and see how in some instances, once you understand the limitations of markets, you can really start to manipulate users and you can start creating an environment in which toxic competition is the default. And we call these the game makers. And the idea is that you have some platforms that act as gatekeepers. And not only do they benefit from market power, what is remarkable is that they operate competition within their ecosystem. So they are so large and vast that companies, other companies use them and the competition takes place within the platform. We as users are within the platforms. And that's interesting because often when we think of competition, we imagine an organic process. We imagine a process where competition just happens and then we speak about state regulation that might distort here. Yet here, what we have is a private landscape where competition takes place, like an autonomy. And those companies design the landscape and they do so in order to benefit themselves. So they tax various companies that operate on that market. They control the flow of data between companies and from companies to users and vice versa. And they can create the incentives. They can create what are the dominant motivations on those markets. Are those markets there to provide us the best service? Or might they be using algorithms and big data in order to ensure that the competition has actually been distorted to become a competition to exploit us rather than to benefit us? So if we look at the next slide, what you see there is one example of the ecosystem from one perspective. So the first level is where those platforms engage with us, the users. And because we provide value by staying on the platform, what you see is that there is an immense effort to hook us. So this might be creating some stickiness on the platform by creating friction when it comes to you considering outside option. It might be about 
different news stories or different posts from other people that are designed usually to irritate you so they lead you to react. Or it might be just when you develop games that your kids might play or you might play that have an addiction component in them. So they are designed to just lure you in. Whatever it is, the aim is to keep us on the platform as much as possible because this is where the value is. You can then service us with more ads, with more targets, and at the same time, you can extract more information from us, which is the second lever that is significant in those ecosystems. We are constantly being subjected to harvesting of data, either through observing our behavior or through access to information, access to our chats, access to our emails. And the technology today is so advanced that Facebook, for example, can classify you based on your emotional state. Companies can identify whether you are at a given moment more likely to engage in one activity or another. What are the biases that dominate you at a given moment? And all the data is then used to attract bidders, advertisers on the other side that want to attract you. And you could look at that market and in a simplistic look, you would say, well, this is a perfectly competitive market because you see a lot of bidders, a lot of advertisers. But in reality, what you see a lot of competition agencies exposed in, in many reports on online advertising, it is an opaque market where the advertisers don't really know what is the impact of the ads that they publish, where money that is being paid at the top of the market, most of it disappears into the system and never reaches the end publisher, the website that actually publishes, where websites often don't have access to data that is crucial for their operation. So we see that if you understand the toxicity, if you understand how we behave, you can actually design systems, environments where competition will be designed to backfire. So this is one of the examples that we use to just highlight that something might look competitive. You can see a lot of action, a lot of activities. You can see bids that take place every millisecond. And yet, while this is competition, it is not the good type of competition. And this is one of the building blocks toward our overall understanding that competition or non-competition are not zero one. It's not black and white. There are different types of competition. And for us as a society, and as policymakers, it's crucial that we identify these distinctions. Now, let's move to, um, to the next story, um, which is <clears throat> a slightly different example of how the ideal of competition is sometimes being used to promote actions that do not serve us. And Maurice will, will focus on that. We'll look at privatization. All right. So when you think about privatization, the, the, what's the first thing that comes to mind? And why is it good? And if you think about it, privatization appeals to several th values that we all hold dear, right? So privatization, first of all, increases competition. Second, greater choice, and who doesn't love more choices? And third, greater autonomy, that you're not beholden to the state monopoly, right? That you now have other options. You can, you know, you, if you don't like your business for one company, you can then choose another. And so that's why it's really appealing. And you could also see, see privatization as maybe hurting a few, but benefiting many. That's the sort of common perception about privatization. And privatization often works. That if you go to, <laughs> if you go to like the a Soviet style restaurant and eat, you know, old meatloaf, you will then appreciate then restaurants that are in, in the free market, right? And we've all been to like either, you know, Soviet era um, uh, countries and, and or even in, in China, eating at, at state-owned restaurants that maybe are the only option, you can then appreciate the competition from the free market. 
And so there is then this draw to privatize a lot of governmental services. But, and you could see that the privatizers, their interests can often be aligned with ours. But there's nothing magical about privatization or competition when the underlying incentives are not aligned. And a good example of this involves private prisons. And why did their stocks increase so heavily, um, heavily when, when Trump was elected? So here's a quiz that we give, which of these statements are true? Now, if you look at it from a pure competition perspective, each one should be true, right? If private prisons provide the same or, or better level of services at lower costs, absolutely, that's what competition does. Second, it provides better rehabilitative services. Absolutely, because you have more entities that can try different um, technologies. They can also try, they might have different philosophies on rehabilitation. They can try different types of programming. And here in this marketplace, the best will then likely then grab greater market share and then others then will replicate it. And then finally, that private prisons have the same interests as we as society does, right? To reduce crime, to promote leniency, and to release um, our criminals early. Each one of those statements is false. Now, it's not just us saying this. It was actually empirical studies done by the Department of Justice that came to that conclusion, and as well as independent economic studies. So why is each statement false? Well. To understand that, you have to look at the incentives of prisons. Prisons are like hotels. They make money every night that a prisoner is in one of their facilities. So to maximize revenues, they have to do two things. They need more prisoners staying for longer periods of time, and they need to reduce costs. Once you take that to the extreme, then, and there are actually economic studies, that show that private prisons keep people longer, not for any um, societal interest, but just because it's more profit maximizing. So they will find things that prisoners do, like leaving a mop out outside and not putting it in the closet. And they'll then punish the prisoner by extending their sentence. You could see then that their incentives are such that that makes them money. They also pay less for guards, for food, they don't have um, these programs because these programs cost money. And so what happens then is that private prisons have been compared to gla gladiator camps. That was actually a term that a judge used to describe one of these private prisons, a gladiator camp. And they have higher violence and they're not necessarily providing a necessary benefits of society. So just by the fact that you privatize, it's not like sort of pixie dust. It's not going to magically make then it better off if the underlying incentives are skewed. So that got us then thinking, where did the term privatization can't come from? And we first thought it had to have come from either Reagan or Margaret Thatcher, right? You think those are the people that um, actually promoted privatization. Interestingly, I remember when this happened, I was at an airport and I, I, I spoke with Ariel and I said, guess where it came from? It came from the Nazis, reprivatisierung, <laughs> that Hitler actually took state-owned enterprises and gave it to the economic elite in order for their political favor. And as what um, uh, Sweeney um, uh, noted when she was getting her PhD dissertation, is that Hitler did this in order to gain the support of the elite for his um, um, uh, Nazi um, party. And so what a term that now means the benefit of many at the expense of few, its origin was really the benefit of a few at the expense of many. So what we argue is that privatization is like competition. It can often work but we can't always assume that it will work, particularly if the underlying incentives are um, misaligned. And that then leads us to, all right, so you've identified four instances where, where uh, competition could be toxic. You also identified multiple culprits. 
what are we going to then do about it other than complain? So as much as we enjoy complaining, uh, we, we had to try and come up with a, with a solution. And the first thing that we already hinted before was to highlight and identify that when you look at competition, there is a spectrum. And whereas in the simplistic discussion that we often have when you talk with policymakers or politicians, when they just speak about competitiveness of market, that, that discussion is just overly simplistic. In fact, once you start looking at the different conditions that are necessary for competition, and once you start looking at what happens when you relax some of them, you identify different types of competition. So the worst one would be toxic competition that really harms everyone. You can also have zero sum competition where you have your self-interest and that's perfectly fine. And sometimes this is the only type of competition that you can have uh, because it is uh, just a race where you compete against another person, one of you have to, to lose. But you can also have positive sum competition. You can have competition where there is an ethical element that is in the background, a competition from which everyone could benefit. And then we thought that if we wanted to develop an ideal, and when we mean an ideal, an ideal just like perfect competition is an ideal, but it's an ideal that although it's not easily attainable, and arguably it is not attainable in practice, understanding it really gives you an idea of what we should aspire to. And that ideal for us is noble competition. The idea that we can actually envisage a competitive landscape where what you do is engage in competition that has a very strong ethical element behind it. We will uh, explore that in a minute with more detail. So when you see that spectrum, it gives you a relatively powerful instrument because when you now look at a market or when you look at a proposal to privatize a certain industry, you can ask yourself, what type of competition do I have or will I have once I take those actions? We did some work on um, uh, on the UK, how the UK transformed those CSI labs that they had, basically at the police uh, labs that look at, uh, at evidence and how they turned them into private hands and the whole industry collapsed. And if at the time someone were to look at it using a spectrum and trying to assess what would be the risk, then it gives you a very powerful background and tools in order to be able to say, well, it might look competitive, but this is not a type of competition that will serve us. We'll have problems either with service, with quality, uh, which is indeed what happened in, in that instance. So with that model uh, in mind, let us uh, talk a little bit about what is this ideal of noble competition. Maurice. All right, so noble competition was probably the hardest part of our book. So we came up with this definition. We saw this Tanner lecture and he was quite influential. He was a um, South African mathematician who worked with Stephen Hawkins. And you wouldn't think he really would have much to say about competition or markets for that point, or even philosophy. But what he talked about was a spectrum similar to what Ariel pointed out here and what motivates individuals. And on his far extent was kenosis. And kenosis was helping, being willing to sacrifice one's life in order to save others. And we were thinking about that. And we would say, how would that apply to competition? And here's how we defined noble competition. And it's gonna sound counterintuitive. It's helping your rivals achieve their full potential. So when we said this, one of our uh, friends, we told him this, and he, he scoffed at us. He said, oh, it's like the Lysine cartel, right? Now, you know from the movie, The um, Informant, as well as the book, in the Lysine cartel, the FBI um, uh, taped the cartel members colluding over Lysine. 
And the ADM executive said, the customers are not his company's friends. He says, you're my friend, the competitor. I wanna be closer to you, right? So our competitors are our friend, our customers are the enemy. Isn't that what you're describing noble competition? Helping your rivals achieve their full potential. That would just be an invitation for collusion. And we really struggled because that's obviously not what we're proposing. And it wasn't until we drafted the Game Makers chapter that it then clicked. And so imagine if you were the game maker for society, how would you want competition to work? And it would be a lot like how you would want your kids to compete. Now, Ariel has two kids, I have four. We don't want them, like if they were to play tennis against one another, we wouldn't want one of our children to bash the other child over the head with a tennis racket. We wouldn't want them to elbow one another. You would want to have the type of competition that would get the best from each of them, like a mutual striving of excellence. And this is a photo that was taken um, in the um, 1960 Olympics. The uh, person, Rayford Johnson, just recently passed away um, the past week. And what we love about this photo is that the rival here was also a classmate at UCLA. And they knew they were in this competitive battle and each pushed the other to the extreme. And they got then the best from it. And from the perspective of the game makers, if you were to divide, you know, divide the competitive process, that's what you would want from the market participants. You would want to devise competition in such a way that companies would be striving to fulfill unmet needs, that they would, it would draw out their best rather than their worst. So it would be ennobling. And then competition actually benefits the citizens rather than the citizens serving competition. So this might seem esoteric, how do we then re, um, reorient to noble competition? So Ariel, what should the state do? So once, once we thought about this idea of noble competition and, and really to stress, when you as an individual compete, you compete because you want to win, but you compete in an environment that the state created that is conducive to the ideal of noble competition. So this is not about you when you compete trying to, to do things that do not serve you. So it, it is a very fine tune, but you have a certain awareness because the whole system around you was designed in a way where you are, as you compete to win, you compete within certain boundaries that are essential for good types of competition to exist. And what we try to see is how can we advance that? And we identify ways in which the state can advance noble competition, in which the industry can advance it, and us as individuals. So to give us a, an image of what the state can do. First of all, the state can understand that not all types of competition deliver the same value to citizens. So part of it is for the state to have the awareness for policymakers to understand that they can, by putting different incentives in place, they can encourage certain types of actions and discourage others. Another element here is that if you want to have competition where some people will be pushed out of the market, you want people to take risk and you are aware that some of them will not succeed, then in your ideology, you need to combine the idea of free market also with an idea of you having to provide some safeguards for those who take part in the competitive process and are rejected from it. So it means that you need to have some rights that will uh, be relevant for those who lost their place of work. You need to look into issues such as the welfare of employees. So what it means is you appreciate the limitations of the competitive process and in order to drive it into a way with, where competition can be fierce and yet benefit us all, you need to create an environment 
in which you have some safety nets. And that's very important. There is, um, you see here some pictures in, in terms of uh, some, some of the values and the freedoms um, uh, that, that are relevant. And, and one of them is of course the freedom uh, from want. And the idea is that you need to have certainty when you compete that if this doesn't work, it is not that you're gonna lose everything. The state will be there to provide you with some minimal aspects, or the system will be designed in a way that very basic rights are safeguard. Because we believe that without that, you very quickly can find that what you encourage is toxic competition. Because if you go back to the example of the beef producers, if what I know is that this is a live or die scenario, then I sometimes have no option. If I know that um, what I need to do is engage in fierce competition, which is unfair, in order to actually be able to support at a very basic level myself, I might decide to do so. But if the state creates a landscape which is much clearer, then the state can really have a role in moving us closer to the, the, the model of noble competition. But it's not only the state, because we appreciate that, of course, there is a balance. You don't want to have too much regulation. There is the, the risk of state error and, and, and uh, mistakes that are done by the state. And it can be quite inefficient sometimes to have too much state intervention. The industry also has a role to play. And this is a whole aspect which we explore on two levels. One, the industry appreciating the limitations of competition needs in itself to put in some safeguards. And indeed, following the beef scandal, the horse scandal in Europe, what you had was leading supermarkets creating a network where they now guarantee the quality. When you buy meat in leading supermarkets these days, you can trace and you know exactly which farm supply the beef that you're eating. So they went to really uh, quite uh, formidable effort to try and ensure the quality of the food chain and ensure that even as they increase the pressure on farmers to deliver goods at lower price, there are enough safeguards around to protect the consumer at the end. But also in addition to that aspect within the organization, what you realize is that if you want to maximize the value of your company, maximize the efficiency of your company, you should be very prudent in the way that you unleash competition between your employees. When what you do is unleashed uncontrolled competition and you create as the controller of your ecosystem, competition where those who fail are immediately thrown out, what you will find yourself is in an environment where people cheat, they sabotage each other. And there is a lot of literature that looks at that but I think the most visible example is Enron. Enron, quite interestingly, was voted many years as the best company to work in. But after it collapsed, um, it emerged that people there, there was a very toxic culture. People were cheating, people were sabotaging each other. The culture there was basically about lie and lie just to get your bonus. And then there was, after, in the aftermath of Ernworm, there was this question, so how come the, the reviews from employees were so positive? And it emerged that it was the HR uh, department that actually completed all the reviews on behalf of Enron employees. In fact, it was a really toxic place to work in, and you see that. And a lot of empirical studies show that for companies to get the best out of employees, what you need is purpose we react much better to the knowledge that there is a combination of a competitive environment where we need to perform, but a higher purpose. So in a way, the whole spectrum that we described for a market also applies within the machinery of a company when you think about employees. And the last ones in our story that have a role to play are us. And although we tend to think that we are insignificant uh, in the world, and sometimes we are, it's important to appreciate that we also have a certain role to play because where we shop and how we behave
creates an impact. And there is an image here from the Milgram study, uh, the Milgram experiment, which of course all of you know. Um, and in the experiment, it, it gives us a really good illustration of the power of authority and how we react. And one of the interesting things in that experiment was that along the line, as you know, uh, the person that uh, was participating was asked to increase the voltage that was uh, applied to the person on the other side. And that person was reacting as if this was real. It wasn't, of course. And despite this going above levels that could hurt significantly the person on the other side, those people that participated in the, in the experiment reacted to authority by just increasing it and increasing. So as long as someone in a white robe told them, no, that's fine, just increase the electric voltage and let's see whether he gives you the right answer. Although they knew that this already said danger, this can kill the person, they still did it. When did they stop? When there was another person in the room that suddenly said, no, I don't think that's right. The minute they were exposed to a dissenting view, suddenly it unleashed something within them that led them immediately to say, oh no, I, I, I don't want to continue with that experiment. And that's the power of dissent. It is the idea that even if you do something that you consider to be insignificant, but you say, no, I do not appreciate that. I do not appreciate the way this company competes. It actually has a really significant power because it affects the way other people view the market. And there is another image here from a farmer's market. And sometimes if you think about farmer markets, maybe that's the type of competition that you want uh, to advance. A competition where you see the people, competition where you can really reward people for the products that they give you. So it's some sort of a combination that in your actions, either by dissenting when you see something that you disagree, if it's employees rights or products or quality, or by rewarding types of businesses that you believe should be the dominant businesses, this is how we can actually get the best out of the competitive process, even as individuals. So I think with that, we should probably, and hopefully we gave you enough uh, food for thought on the, the, the massive benefits, of course, of competition, but also appreciating where and when competition could backfire. So thank you, Professor Ayarizak and Professor Maurice Stuck. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. I don't know if uh, Professor Maurice could please stop sharing the screen. And thank you very much, Professor Maurice. And it was a brilliant presentation. We read the book, and when we read the book, it cannot be better, but you presenting together makes even better. And, and well, you, you guys are really one of the best authors on trust and can uh, produce a good framework for discussion. So now we're going to have our debate. So the word is yours, Professor Ana Frazão. Thank you, Professor Vinicius. Good afternoon to all. Firstly, I would like to thank Professor Vinicius Klein for the invitation to be part of this amazing panel compounded of two of the most important authors of antitrust law, whose work is so admired in Brazil. I am a great fan of you. So it's really a pleasure for me to be here and congratulations for the brilliant presentation. I will try to, to, to present some questions. It was very difficult to select just a few ones for our debate because the book is so rich, so interesting, but I hope you like the four questions I will present. My first question is about the title, the framing of the problems you present in the book and the very idea of, of competition over those. I have to confess, professors, that when I first looked at the title of the book, I became a little uh, uh, puzzled by the idea of a competition over those. After all, I have been following your work and your efforts to defend competition, to broaden the purposes of antitrust. And for me, your concern regarding the necessity to restore the protection of the competitive process was very clear. 
However, the title of the book suggests that competition is not necessarily good. Just in its beginning, the, the preface uh, mentions a, a very interesting point. Uh, the consensus is so absolute that it amounts to an almost religious belief in competition as the key of our prosperity. If a business behavior or a law is pro-competitive, it's inherently good. If uncompetitive, it's presumptively bad. And uh, uh, my first thought when I read it was, have they changed their minds? Don't they defend competition anymore? And of course, after I read the preface, I perfectly understood your point, which is totally convergent with all the ideas you have sustained about antitrust. And after finishing the book, the conclusion was even clearer. Uh, what you criticize is the bad competition, the one which results from deregulation, the one which is associated with the ideology of free markets. And uh, that's why you expressly recognized the necessity to promote a form of competition that actually serves people and not the opposite. Now, so according to the book, the idolatry of free markets has turned us from citizens into market servants, benefiting companies that are exploiting us in several ways. There is a, a, an interesting part of the book when you say, sometimes unwittingly, sometimes cynically, our lawmakers have sought us out, taking away our protections and removing our safety net, all in the name of encouraging even more competition. And you complete your thought highlighting how lobbyists, how policymakers and powerful firms have been using uh, uh, competition ideology to hide their corruption, exploitation, ineptitude, and ignorance. And I perfectly agree with all these issues, uh, but, but the way you frame the problem regarding all the examples you, you mentioned, uh, make us certain initial strangeness as it happened with me and probably with some of your readers, including the progressive ones that you mentioned in the preface. Uh, I know you work with a very big range of examples, including competition among students, among workers within the firms. But when we think about the game makers scenario, for, for instance, the digital markets, uh, it seems to me that part of the problems derive more from the lack of competition uh, because we all know that competition is not just a game without rules. It should be a game with adequate rules in order to implement the rivalry on the merits. So while I was reading some examples of the book, I thought all the time, uh, what is the real problem here? Is it competition over those or lack of competition, competition itself or deregulation and this idolatry of free markets? Is this a problem of companies' purposes? As you said, a criticism against the shareholder value theories in order to avoid cases like the Boeing uh, example you've just uh, mentioned. And as I know that you had probably considered all these reactions of your public when you decided on the title, uh, all of the framings, I am very curious to learn a little bit about the background. That is to hear from you why you adopted this framing uh, in spite of the, the strangeness, I can say, that it may cause in your readers, especially the ones who have been following your previous work and all the cares uh, you, you have with the, the competition issue. Uh, my second point is about uh, the relation between markets and state. For me, a very important point of the book, uh, the provocation you make about perfect markets and perfect competition. So in chapter five, you mentioned so many examples that require state intervention, such as uh, the cases of suboptimal competition, negative externalities, public goods, imperfections, market failures. And an interesting aspect of your criticism, at least for me, 
is the fact that you recognize the ideological roots of the discussion. So you mentioned very clearly the role of the powerful companies by means of their lobbyists in establishing an understanding favoring more competition and less regulation. Uh, that's why you conclude uh, and I will quote you, the competition ideology when carefully deployed can serve as an excellent shield against the state intervention and as a sword to control the market, dictate the rules of the game and eliminate threats to their profits. And your approach highlights the importance of power and ideology in shaping economic uh, theories. And the way you put the problem reminds me of a warning by, by two authors. First, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, according to whom we should not have been discussing the trade-off between regulation or deregulation, but rather the extent of regulation, trying to achieve new balances and more adequate arrangements between states and markets. And you sustain that states have a very important role in the maintenance of all markets, not only fostering a healthy competition, but also expanding the safety net to protect the well-being of those left behind by competition, for instance. And this reminds me, uh, uh, Krugman, who sustains that several economic ideas normally used to justify the deregulation agenda should have already be con been considered dead due to their total lack of adherence to empirical evidence, but they keep alive. They keep alive like zombies because the economic elites spend a lot of money with scholars and think tanks with the purpose of uh, maintaining them artificially. So it seems to me that there is a, a marketplace of ideas and it's very dysfunctional and non-competitive uh, because the dominance of some agents can distort it very easily. So I want to know if is that the way you see the problem as well, if you can talk a little more about the importance of ideas and how they can be manipulated. My third question is about a, a chapter. I really loved chapter nine which redefines an ideal of competition that may reflect our values. So in that chapter, you show uh, the contrast between a good competition, which took place from the late 1940s until the mid 1970s, surrounded by regulatory protections, uh, a circumstance that fostered, according to you, innovation, quality, and improvement of our material living standards. But in the following period, there was the dismantling of the existing regulations and the safety net, and competition became what you call the, the panacea for nearly every societal ill. And you present a, a perfect conclusion that I will read to our audience, uh, a very important point of the book for me. What has happened is that the idealized perfect competition portrayed in the economic textbooks has been squeezed out by the bad forms of competition, monopolistic or toxic or both crony capitalism in which big business and big government cozy up to each other to stifle the good forms of competition is the order of the day. Economists who have studied the data reveal that under this system, markets have actually become more concentrated and less competitive. And while the profit margins of the most powerful companies increased, innovation may have actually declined. Uh, it's a very strong criticism against the mainstream. Uh, you mentioned, for instance, that under these circumstances, we, we have been experiencing like socialism for the rich capitalists and capitalism with its rugged individualism for the poor who are left to struggle on their own. 
and the chapter shows how antitrust and regulation issues can be connected to democracy and inequality. So it's a very important chapter for me and I would be pleased if you could talk a little more about it. And my last question is about how, how we can define competition whose concept is like a, a sponge as you conclude and how we can implement the noble competition you propose. Uh, because uh, considering our reality, especially for the purposes of the antitrust law, uh, it would be desirable if we could at least overcome uh, the consumer welfare standard and try to focus on the competitive process uh, to curb the distortions and abuses implemented by some powerful agents trying to restore like the idea of competition on the, the merits. However, your proposal goes much further. So you criticize selfishness and materialism. Uh, so the solution is not just eliminating the distortions, but rather adopting a new understanding of competition, very different from the toxic and the zero sum competition, which are both uh, motivated by self interest. Uh, so we, we, we need to restructure competition under different values, such as cooperation, solidarity, and your, your definitions of ethical competition and noble competition are, are broad, they are ambitious. Their implementation, as you, you've just recognized, would probably require much more than legal reforms, but rather an ethical and societal reform so if you could please talk a little more about the feasibility of your solution, the role of the law in implementing it, and the main challenges and difficulties involving this purpose. And uh, I would appreciate if you could talk a little more about how we could implement these standards of competition in developing countries such as Brazil. So these are my questions, professors Irio and Maurice. I am very, very happy and very honored to be with you uh, this afternoon. It has been a very rich experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, wonderful questions, challenging questions, and really uh, um, great work in terms of uh, um, giving us a lot to, to discuss and to think of. So I really appreciate your, your wonderful questions. Uh, I think Maurice and I will probably try to address them one by one and just jointly um, throw some ideas. Uh, and if we miss something, do, do come back to us and tell us if-, if Please be free, Professor. <laughs> tell us if we fail to do, uh, to do something. Um, so your first question was um, about framing, uh, framing the book as, as overdose. And, and, and we try to explain it in the book, but maybe it's worth saying, I mean, both Maurice and I obviously been trying and aiming to champion competition as, as the most important thing. And we do believe very much so in the power uh, of competition. So why frame it as overdose and not as something else? Because a lot of the times when you speak with people, they will say, well, this is a problem of not enough competition. This is, this is just a market failure. So it's almost when you have um, a disease and you look at a symptom and you explain it in a certain way. Whereas what we try to do is to dig deeper and try to understand, so what stands at the heart of it? And that links in a way also to your second question in terms of ideology. It links to the elevation of the idea of competition into something that should remedy everything. I sometimes imagine it as you know, there is a dead body um, somewhere on the street and the police arrives and they see someone with a knife just above the body and all he needs to say, oh, but this is pro-competitive. And the police will say, oh, so sorry. I mean, we really, how silly of us. If it's pro-competitive, then surely that's fine. And that's, I mean, of course, great exaggeration, but in a way you can get away with quite a lot if you argue that something is competitive. As a society, the fact that you feel uneasy about it is almost a fact, and we both felt very uneasy about it as well, is almost a proof 
of how we overdosed on the idea that this is a magical solution. This is some sort of a remedy that all you need to do is increase it and we will magically uh, all, all become, um, become better. Uh, I'm sure Maurice has more ideas on, on that. Yeah, so, I mean, the reason that we, we, we chose overdose was that it is the remedy for everything. And the belief is that what, whatever the ailment, competition will, will do its trick, right? So we think about it, it's actually a cheap remedy because for the government, they can say, well, let's just have competition. And then if you come up short, then it's on you, right? It's not the state's fault because competition is a meritocracy. And if somehow you're not on the winning end, if you're poor, if, well, then that's on you. And it's very easy. So it's cheap to administer. It's easy to, um, um, you don't really require any sort of oversight because markets are self-correcting. It leads to the efficient outcome. And you could see that politicians, whatever the problem, like education in the United States, oh, public schools aren't working, let's just have competition. And I think what, I mean, there's, there's several fundamental problems with that. One fundamental problem is that competition cannot provide in every circumstance, that there's a limit, that competition might provide efficient services, but it's not going to assure that every hospital is going to have the ventilators that are necessary in an emergency. It's not going to assure that they have the safety masks. It's not going to assure that everyone has access to the mail. That's why in the United States, when it was founded, you know, had public mail because they realized that if left to markets, people that lived in rural areas would not get mail service. And so there's a, a public need as, as, as well. Um, with respect to some people then come back to us and say, well, what you're identifying is not a problem with competition. It's a problem with regulation. And I think this is also goes back to the, you know, your first and your second point is that even if you have noble competition, it's not necessarily going to provide some key services like healthcare, um, like um, maybe like a, a, a social net, like social security, or access to the, um, to the mails, access to the internet. And you do need to have a public option that's, that's available. Then when we started thinking about it, <laughs> what, this is you know, one of the great things about writing the book is one of the critics of this is the, from like the Chicago school, right? And the, you, you mentioned about self-interest. I happened to be at a conference where one of the stalwarts, the still like the existing stalwarts of the Chicago school. And we were, we were kind of taking a few, shots at some of his public opinions. So I asked him some questions. I said, do you really think that competition is warfare? And he's like, absolutely. And he, he saw it as zero sum. I said, well, don't you think like positive sum competition? I'm talking about like Michael Porter and the like, nothing to do with it. Then I started going through some of the overdoses and I mentioned about drip pricing. And he says, well, that has to be the efficient outcome. If that's what the market participants are doing, and if it's competitive, that's the efficient outcome. And I actually said, no, it isn't. You know, the prices are higher. Markets where it's regulated, it's actually more efficient. There's greater price transparency. And then he said, well, if people are dumb, then they're only to be blamed. Like they need to be fleeced. So after I heard that, I'm like, you know what? we're not gonna change what we have in the book. <laughs> that this is exactly why we want this book out. Because we've moved so far from the Chicago school. And I think even in the last few years, we're moving away from the consumer welfare standard. And if you look at like the DOJ and the FTC complaints, they're looking at a competitive process. But fundamentally, what we identify is that people aren't like that. And what makes strong economies are not necessarily selfish people who are only looking out for themselves. When you look at some of the empirical studies that are out there, 
Stronger economies rely on trust. They, regard, they rely on other regarding behavior. They're you know, looking out for other people. I mean, that's how you can support a market economy. And so, yes, when we wanted to go beyond competition and beyond zero sum competition, there's a lot of money left on the table if you just restrict competition to toxic and zero sum. That really the value added is when you go to positive sum and noble competition, because now you have companies rather than just lying and cheating and engaging in these sharp tactics to just steal share from one another, you can actually have then companies providing services to, you know, for unmet needs. In order to say, you know, what's good for GM is good for the country, is you could say, well, what's good for the country is good for GM. It, this is what like Michael Porter talks about, shared value. It gives a reorientation. And a lot has been um, written about going beyond shareholder maximization. And I think that's what we're tapping into. And I think with the coronavirus, a lot of the things that we pointed out here came to bear. That if you have states that are competing against one another as to who gets a ventilator, or if you have this like competition among individuals as to the vaccine, you may not necessarily get the most efficient outcome. There, there was in this circumstance here, you had a certain degree of collaboration as well. And you need to have like the government intercede to say, where should the ventilators go? Because otherwise it's gonna to go to like California and New York, like Governor Cuomo says, you know, we're bidding against all these other states and they're just auctioning off. And meanwhile, thousands of people are dying. And I think what we realize is that competition was not the sort of elixir that will get us out of the pandemic, nor should we assume that competition will be elixir that will automatically resuscitate our economy. Competition can be important, but there's also an important role for the state to play, also an important role for companies to play, and what sort of um, purpose do they provide their workers? And then finally, our role in choosing what type of competition do we want to support as a, as a consumer? So shall we just, shall we just continue with, with some comments or? Yes, Professor, if you want to continue answering, Professor, yeah. I have some questions from the audience, audience but if uh, you want to answer all the questions for Ana, no problem. You know, you, you, it's, we're just like, you know, you leave us with no guardrails, we just continue. So uh, <laughs> it's my uh, pleasure. <laughs> it's pleasure of the audience. It's a wonderful talk. No, because it's I, the comments that Maurice make really lead us, lead us beautifully um, to, to the next question, because uh, a lot of what Maurice raised is, is about our beliefs and about the way we imagine market should work or could work. And I think here, Maurice mentioned how we are moving away from the Chicago school. And you have, if you look just around you, we are part of an ongoing change. This is not us looking at history of 20, 30, 40 years ago. Look at what happened yesterday with the Facebook complaint. Look at what happened uh, a month ago uh, with the Department of Justice. When you look around you, you see that there is an ongoing change of our understanding of what works and what doesn't. The reason we are overdosing on competition is for many things. And Maurice mentioned, of course, the fact that it's the cheapest way to outsource responsibility to anyone. Uh, but this didn't come from, from thin air. The idea, funny enough, is often promoted by the most powerful companies because in our culture, we link together competition and deregulation by putting your trust in competition what you're saying is that, of course, the market can deliver. And if the market can deliver, then you can advance the second agenda. The government 
have a more limited role. And again, we are far from arguing that the government should have a massive role, but we're just highlighting that if you over squeeze the government, you will certainly not get the result that you aspire to because competition just cannot deliver. So you have a dual argument that is being put forward. And funny enough, if you look at who are those that advance it, it will often be lawyers that get obscene amounts of money from companies that they often do not disclose that are paying them that money at conferences in which they present it at this, these are the purest forms of ideology and the same for economists. So what you find is that many times we are being bombarded year after year for many years with an ideology that is there because it serves a certain money generating initiative and, and, and function for very leading and, and significant corporations. And at the heart of it, they are right. Competition is good. Governments do not need to intervene across the board. But that became such a powerful lever that what you see is that it just became as, as this Teflon uh, boundary. Every argument that you would make that maybe the markets <clears throat> are not working would immediately bounce, bounce off. And because we, we, we started um, to have a lot of engagements with um, agencies and a lot of groups in the US after a virtual competition was published, at the beginning, Maurice and I were hammered. You know, you would go somewhere and you would be, it would be as if they would chase you out of the, of the room with, you know, with whatever they had, um, because how dare you suggest that intervention is required. And my last, I remember last time in DC, it was the ABA and, and the whole audience was like, no, no. And, and it was really, I remember saying, you need to wake up. You're sitting here in your little bubble. And uh, that year already around, there were so many events of other people arguing completely the opposite, just outside the hotel. And you still believe in it. And what you see is that we are truly witnessing how a small crack in the dam had now opened. And you see the Congress report, you see the Department of Justice, you see the FTC, you see, of course, ongoing action in Europe in other jurisdictions, you see the ACCC in Australia, you see a realization that the promise that just increased the competitive pressure and decrease intervention that turned into the promised that just decrease intervention and this will just fix because the amended version is competition is just behind the corner. You know, disruptive innovation is just behind the corner. Do not worry. That promise failed to deliver. Markets are not competitive. Most of the markets are overly concentrated. Most of us do not see the benefit of competition. We see some benefit. It's only a very small portion of the benefit that we could have seen if markets were not as distorted. So ideology plays a massive role here. And by making us all just understand, just having the idea of competition overdose, it's possibly a first step in us just understanding that it's a much more nuanced debate and we shouldn't accept any person, especially if that person represents a monopoly that argues for just let the market, you know, run its course because, because, because any intervention is bad intervention. No, I would accept that if the market is competitive because then really don't do much, maybe try to work around the market to turn the competition into something which is positive some, hopefully noble. Uh, but don't intervene. But most of the markets where you have these arguments are the worst markets. So I think um, the, 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 the capturing of the ideology has been very distinct. It might be that it's easy for me to say because I'm in Europe and I can see it with a European eye looking at the US and elsewhere. Uh, Maurice, of course, in the US has been doing a lot of work trying to expose that. Uh, but sometimes when you speak to people in the US, it's very hard to actually convince them and they get back to you with the same mantras uh, again and again. But, but, but I, I think the one thing is, is that if you just ask anybody along the street, is competition working for you? 
they might say generally, yeah, yeah, competition, they like competition, but then it's just people are tired. I mean, we're in this rat race and we've been competing again and again. I mean, Arla and I have been like just in academia and you think about it and it can just be so tiring. And then at the end of the day, as you would just say, is it just me or is this system overall not really working? Like, why is it that you talk with American families and their kids are just, there's this panic that if their kids don't get into the right school, that's it, they're screwed. That, you know, they're, they're, they're walking along this, um, this, this ridge line and one false step, they're gonna go into this abyss. And there's just this incredible insecurity. And when you look at the underlying data, it's just that most of the wealth, most of the, um, the growth in income have not only just gone to the top 1%, but to the top 0.1%. And the rest of us are just fending for scraps. And I think, you know, I, Ariel and I was like, is it just us? Or, and we start realizing, no, we're all in this. We're in this sort of collective rat race in so many different markets like college education. And then if you decide to pull back and say, you know what, I'm not gonna compete, then other people are like, oh, great. And then that's good for me, right? But it's, I think for, when, when we started presenting this, we started going to the competition authorities and we were expecting a lot of pushback. And actually the, the message was the opposite. They were some of the biggest supporters and some of their economists gave us the best insights. Because I think fundamentally there is this recognition that competition can be good, but it's not the magical elixir. As one economist told us, competition isn't cracked out what it's always meant to, you know, what it's always meant to be. That at times it works and at times it can give you X but it may, may not give you the just and fair outcome. And that's where, you know, other like industry and individuals have a role to play. Thank, thank you very much, Professor. I think one of the questions from the audience that from our, my friend and another organizer of this event, Professor Eduardo Gabon has asked it, is already answered is about the relationship between toxic competition and market failures. Or I think the better word is market limitation, but this is my, because it's not failure because market cannot do anything. And you guys show that. But I would like to ask one question from you and because what do you think about the role of behavior economics? Because you have uh, mentioned that the presentation and the, do you think it can like do a broad revolution in antitrust or do you think it's more limited? Like a better remedies or to just one kind of uh, problem or it's, Well, well, I mean, I'll start off on this one. When, when there were a few people that, that talked about behavioral economics, I remember when I was at the Department of Justice, I, I looked at some of the work by Richard Thaler, among others, and I asked the, the DOJ economist, does this have any relevance for us? And he's like, oh, no, those are good cocktail anecdotes, but markets drive out irrationality. And I, I said, is that right? You know, is, is that? So there... I remember like Ariel said, it's like when we were talking about behavioral economics back in the um, late 90s um, and, and early, uh, you know, when we were talking about um, behavioral economics, people looked at us like we were crazy, that, that there's no role of behavioral economics. And now you see with the DOJ complaint that they cite behavioral economics. And so I think now there's an, it, I mean, it's not even, it's just economics. It's no longer even behavioral economics. It is a recognition that, that, um, that you can have market failures as a result and that behavioral, re behavioral remedies, particularly behavioral economics provides remedies that can widen the toolbox. So like your choice of default options and the like. Um, one of the things that we recommend in the book, and this is like, so how can we then um, prevent the sort of toxic competition? One of the things that we point out in the book is to expand the toolkit. So it's no longer just unfair and deceptive um, um, acts and practices, but it would also include abusive 
practices, um, exploitative practices. And the, uh, the, one of the, uh, the agencies, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has those tools. And I, I think that would be um, um, a good idea. Um, but in, in Europe, Ariel, I mean, I mean, I'd, the UK is one of the leaders in, in incorporating behavioral economics. I mean, what do you think? It's not, it's not as revolutionary there, right? I think especially when you focus on the digital environment, this is, this is the thing that really catapulted the debate to the front um, because all of us can recognize that. You, you know that uh, the competitor may be a click away, but competition isn't. You know that if there is a link in front of you, you are more likely to press it than to go to page number four and look for something. I mean, you, you can actually feel it. And so a lot of this is now almost obvious. It's obvious that you can affect the stickiness. It's obvious that you can engage in the development of advanced algorithms that will take into account all our biases. In fact, it's good business. It would be irrational for you not to make use of it. Just like in a brick and mortar environment, it would be irrational for you if you own a shop not to design it in a way that will encourage people to purchase. It would be irrational for you if you're a car trader not to develop a certain type of speech that create confidence and create an impression of very limited outside options. The digital environment uh, enabled us to, in a way, amplify our ability to make use of these biases. And indeed, from drip pricing uh, to, to, there are over 100 classified biases that you can make use of. So in one of the meetings that Maurice and I had with one of the competition agencies, it was wonderful because we actually went with them over the toolbox of biases. And the question then, and it's a challenging question for us as competition policymakers, enforcers, uh, is that a problem or not? So the question is really, and this is why this is such an exciting period, if you understand that there is a bias, now you understand that it can be exploited. You understand that it used to be exploited by humans at let's say a minimal level. Now with algorithms and uh, big data, you can exploit it to the max. Now your question is, should that be allowed or not? Should I introduce ex ante regimes um, that can intervene regulation? Should I turn it into a competition problem? I mean, these are really important things, but to ignore them, would be to go back to an idea that Maurice mentioned earlier of this supreme rationality that if you are not this rational agent, then it's your problem. And I think we all know that this, this is old news. This is like relying on science from the, the previous century. Um, and you wouldn't do that if you go to a doctor. And I think it's fair to say that you wouldn't do that now with our better and more nuanced understanding if you think about the economics of markets and how markets operate. There's really no reason to try and simplify it once you have evidence. There are challenges, no doubt, because it sometimes is challenging to embed these notions into a decision-making. Of course, it is less certain because reality is less certain. Everything is much easier when all you have is an equation that presents itself as if it approximates reality. Once you try to approximate the complexity of reality, okay, it's slightly more challenging. But if competition law is about creating a dynamic that serves us, a dynamic where we optimize on efficiency, on welfare, I think it's a, it's a natural evolution that you experience everywhere. Thank you very much, Professor. Professor Anna, do you wanna say any more comments? No, no, just to, to thank the opportunity to hear Professor Zario and Maurice, it was a great pleasure. And thank you for all your comments about my issues. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think uh, you can uh, end now with uh, some final words from each one of you and final comment maybe. I don't know who wants to start. Maurice, do you want to say a few final word, words? Sure. So. <laughs> What, what uh, I mean, I, what are the key takeaways that we hope that um, you get from, from this talk is first off, 
before you say competition is great or competition is the answer, if you just have a little bit of doubt that then I, I think we've, we've done our, our, our job. So first, if, whenever you say competition that you just don't have this reflexive, oh, competition is great, that you just normally say, it's almost like, you know, you get the, the buzzer and then you get the, the treat. You just associate the two. If we can just delink that, that would be one good thing. But then I would think longer term, and I think this is for all, for everyone involved in the competition um, industry, whether professors or um, lawyers or judges or economists, is how can we make it better? How can we actually design a competitive process that lifts up more boats rather than what we have currently? And then even if we design the the process optimally, who are we leaving out and how can we be ensured that we're going to protect them as well? That is really the longer term um, um, uh, goal. And I think we're going to have collision points going on when we're going to see the collision between competition and privacy. That's going to be an area where they can be complementary, but they can be at odds. Competition and sustainable environment that's another area that, that's a hot topic. But I think ultimately what we're gonna see is that competition is one tool among many and how do we then optimize the competition tool so it actually brings out our best rather than our worst and it actually serves us rather than our serving it. Ariel? I think these are beautiful words to, to end with our uh, session. So um, I... I think we'll end with that and, and maybe thank you again for, for hosting us and give us, giving us the opportunity to, to present our research. Thank you. Thank you. What, Professor Anna? Well, I just want to, to thank you one more time and to, to say to Professors Maurice and Ariel that their work is very important for us. So keep doing your wonderful job because I think we need this kind of reflections, especially in a country such as Brazil, where we have to, to incorporate all these reflections and we have to adapt them to our reality as a, a developing country. So I want to thank you and to, to say that I am a great admirer of you. I am very honored to be with you this afternoon. Thank you very much. It's our pleasure, thank you. So thank you, it's my pleasure and I'm gonna invite you again because Maurice said that he's gonna launch a new book next year. And for yeah. sure, PCI can host uh, another debate about your new book next year. And if you wanna put on the- Please agenda, invite me. <laughs> yes, I'm gonna invite uh, Professor Anna also to, to talk about and do the debate again. So thanks very much for all of you. In the name of BCI, it's an honor to, for me also to be here moderating this wonderful panel. So thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you so much.